Hello and welcome to the Barefoot Miniatures Guide of how to paint Iron Warriors models as well as weather pretty much anything ever. So I wanted to make this guide. I originally filmed painting an Iron Warriors tank, the Rhino, in January of this year, so it's now, what is it, eight months on? Um, so I wanted to make this guide about Iron Warriors, but then I thought, really, the things that I'm gonna do in this video aren't specific to the Iron Warriors model. And the way that I try to approach painting is that anything you do is process-driven rather than specifically like skills-driven or hand eye coordination <laughs> driven, I know that might sound stupid, but it's just it's not technique, it's just knowing the process and following that out to get a, an end result. So I'm basically going to show steps that can be used on pretty much anything, like I've used them on the Rhino that you might have seen in the, the thumbnail to this video, but also I use the exact same steps on the Iron Circle, my, any Iron Warrior that you see that I've painted, the Slave Ogryn Gang that I've just painted for the Necromunda video, they all follow pretty similar steps and I just add or subtract things that I do and don't need for the models. So an infantry model may not get as much of the final step of blowing dirt onto them. Like you'll, you'll get that when I get to it in the video. <laughs> um, so yeah, he's, he's just about adding and subtracting steps that you think are appropriate for the model basically. And yes, color selection matters, but I personally think that knowing what steps to select will be your greatest weapon in miniature painting. And techniques I think are more important than having the exact right colour selection. So I'll just grab two colours off my shelf. So I've got Calidor Sky and McCrag Blue. That I, these are the, just the first colours that I picked up off my shelf. What you do to these colours or whatever colours you might do, I think is, is more important than the actual colours themselves. So yeah, follow along with this video and hopefully it'll explain the beginnings of how I go about these steps in the context of painting a specific model. So onto the primer step. Now this can be any primer. I use Vallejo uh, primer through the airbrush just because it's so much cheaper than the spray can alternatives. I find I actually have to siphon it out or strain it out. I use a 3D printer, like sort of resin filter for that and just strain it into my airbrush cup if you're ever having problems with it spitting or getting clogged quite a lot, because I used to in the past. So that's a tip, just primer through some sort of filter paper into your brush or into a container, then into your airbrush. And it just works perfectly and is so cheap. So next gonna be the pre-shade step. I do actually think of it like this in Iron Warriors, although I'm just applying silvers, because I'm, I am going to apply a glaze over this pre-shade or zenithon up, zenithol, if you wanna call it a zenithol. Um, but yeah, I'm gonna put a base of the darkest color, which is the gunmetal gray. Now, you might want to leave some parts of the model black if you want an extreme contrast in your glaze color for iron warriors obviously you're going to go all over with the silver going to a black would definitely be a bold move though try it out if you would like because some of those extreme contrast schemes do look really nice and you will be bringing the look of the bottom of the model up with the weathering as we get into it later anyway so in the next step of the pre-shade i'm going to use the dark aluminium and i'm just going to come out blasting and get the main faces of that tank. I'm gonna tidy up the top where we can see the metal hasn't quite adhered right and has a bit of a weird fleck to it. And then I'm gonna start using the cone of my airbrush's projection to go along the edges and get the top two thirds of the model with the brighter color in this pre-shade. Now, you might select some areas to have a particular focus on them. 
I tried to get the lighter areas towards the front left of the tank. Is it that one? It's that one. So as you're looking at it face down as a gaming piece, it's this front left that I'm going to be targeting with basically the most light. I'm next going to go on to the, the lightest colour, which is the Vallejo Chrome. And I'm really going to start picking out those edges as well as anywhere that the light really would shine on heavily. Now, I do think watching it back, I go a little overboard with this, but I'm not going to worry about that too much. I think I realised it at the time and I'm just going to get on with the rest of the paint job and save it in weathering. So the, ne <laughs> so the next step is the glaze step. And this is going to be where you apply basically washes over the top to color that pre-shade. Now, I already want that silver to be my pre-shade um, and my base color for the Iron Warriors. So it's not gonna change much from there for me, but I do use multiple coats of Wonder Wash, which I got off the MKA courses back in the day. Now, Cult cool of Paint or Matt Kane's courses, um, either or. And I'm going to, in that, have two parts Agrax, one part Nun Oil, one part Seraphim Sepia, one part Carabog Crimson, one part Drutchy Violet. And then I thin all of those, I just mix them, all the pots together, thin it down with some Pledge Floor Wax, Floor Varnish, and basically just do that with an amount of Floor Varnish that gives me anything that I'm feeling on the day. Like I don't think about it too much because I then just adjust the amount of glazes that I'm going to do to suit the thickness of that. And if you get it wrong, I just mix in some more inks. Like I use this often enough that I don't really care how much I come out with so long as it's a lot. And I just know it's going to get used up in the future. So in between this, you want to be careful if you're drying it with a hair dryer just so you don't shift about too much of that glaze i know i sometimes get pools if i'm not being careful um so yeah do be careful with the hair dryer knocking about the glaze and getting like tide marks after you've already spent time doing the pre-shade because that can be really annoying though not unfixable like with anything just <laughs> have fun and we will fix it in the weathering later on in the steps so this is one thing to note here as well, is that it will make your pre-shade on this Iron Warriors tank darker. So even though I've gone too bright on my initial shading steps, I wasn't too worried about it because I knew this Wonder Wash would make it much darker. And that's true for pretty much any varnish type thing that you put over a model. It will just, I think it traps the light a bit more or it just will. So. Yeah, don't get too stressed if the pre-shade happens to be slightly too light in this instance because we can always darken it down in the future. It's the contrast that you were looking for in that initial step. Next, I'm going to start applying stripes to the model in aesthetically pleasing places. This, I like quite like to have an off-center stripe at the front of the model pretty standard right I mean I'm not shattering any ground with this a stripe down the back hatch um, and that's pretty much it for stripes I've seen like diagonal stripes work quite well on some legions um, I didn't like it when I did it to a few of my Iron Warriors vehicles but it just depends on how flamboyant your legion is of where you want to stripe off here so I'm applying Tamiya tapes uh, be careful when you're storing your tapes that you put them in a bag or something so the edges of the tape don't get dust on because that will stop getting a nice clean line with your tape. Um, but yeah, ap apply your tapes to the model. If you want to know how to space your tapes evenly, I use separate pieces of tape to judge the width. So I know obviously like the three mil tape is three mil or I use a spot on the model as you can see on the back of the tank I'm using the, what are these called? The, the feet of the door that slam down that are at the top of the hatch to judge where to put that stripe vertically. And it's just good to have a, a nice marker on the model to do this from. So I tidy up the, <laughs> the outskirts of the tape with a bit of a knife. Cause you always want your stripes to be consistent really. 
can be quite noticeable when they're wavy, though we can, again, save it in weathering if it happens to be wavy in the, after this step. And then I start applying chipping medium, heavy chipping fluid by... Where is it? I start applying heavy chipping fluid. This one's from MIG that I'm using here. And any chipping fluid will do. There is also the... There is also the hairspray technique, but I find the heavy chipping fluid is just much easier and more convenient to use, to be honest. There isn't a particular thought in doing this. Like you can apply it with an airbrush to get a smooth coat, but I just like to whack it on with a brush because it's just the easiest way to go about it, I find. Don't worry about going too heavy with this if you notice any bubbles after we put the next coat of paint on, just take them off off as part of the chipping process so just slap some chipping fluid on and then we'll get on to the next the next segment which is applying the color to the model so i'm going to apply black to my iron warriors vehicles here i just like it as the accent color rather than having a load of hazard stripes on the model i just find it a bit too garish personally i know sacrilege for an iron warrior but i actually just like quite a muted iron warriors scheme so I'm gonna do that. After a nice even coat has been applied, we get to take off all of the masking tape, which is quite satisfying. Uh, and after that, we'll get into the actual first weathering step that we get on this model, and that is chipping using the heavy chipping fluid. So how we're going to do that is we're gonna apply some water to all the areas which have got heavy chipping fluid on. That'll activate the heavy chipping fluid. And then we're gonna start picking away at the colour and in the location where the heavy, chi heavy chipping fluid is and that will hopefully scratch the model. Now I'm going to do this in different directions. You can get a wire brush specialist tool for it but to be honest I found nothing better than some tweezers especially with a slightly sharp end as these god I think these Tamiya tweezers again god I'm just I, I swear I'm not paid by Tamiya it just happens that I've used all of these up to now. So I'm going to be trying to do quite a random pattern to the chips. Try and alternate the direction of the vehicle or model in your hand as well as alternating the direction of your hand doing the chipping and that will maximise the amount of randomness to the chips. Because you don't want to... Naturally you will fall into patterns just as a human and you want to avoid that as much as possible. Now, if it's starting being really hard to chip and you go through to back to the original plastic, don't worry. We're going to just weather over that later and you will never know that it's happened. Basically, at any point in any of these guides where something goes wrong, you shouldn't be thinking that you need to start again. Just sort of take a few breaths and get on with the processes and it will all be fine in the end. And if not, it's not the end. After you've done that step with the heavy chipping fluid, you're going to want to seal the model in. Now, again, I use the Vallejo spray varnish through my airbrush just because it's the cheapest thing around. I go with the gloss here because I want then that to carry over to when I do decals. But other than that, there's no real thought in what varnish I'm using here. It's just to tie in with the further steps. If you don't want to apply decals, I'd probably recommend using a matte varnish because that's going to react better with the enamels and oils that we'll use later. So long as it's not specifically pin washing that you want to do with your oils, it's not my favorite technique ever, but it's one of them. So just some nice thin coats with the varnish and then we'll get on with the next step, which is actually applying some decals straight away. So what I'm going to be doing here is over the top of the gloss varnish, I'm just selecting my decals. I've selected some stripes to accentuate those aesthetically pleasing stripes we put onto the vehicle before. And they're going to be my hazard stripes, very muted around. And yeah, just apply them as you like to the model. I always put the Legion marking on the left because that's where the tactical shoulder pad goes on the left, right? for the Legion marking. And then I've got some Mechanicum decals and Skitari decals that I'm gonna apply elsewhere to basically accentuate the Greek themed that I've got going on with my Iron Warriors 
and all of their auxiliaries. I then apply some micro sol, which is the solvent version that will basically sear through all of the edges and make the decals look painted onto the tank. And I do that and leave it overnight. If you've got time, I do put multiple layers of that micro sol on every couple of hours, but I don't think you need to at all. And I think it's just one of those, do you know like those, <laughs> those compulsive things that we all do in the miniatures painting and gaming world where he's like, ah, oh, well, a bit of micro sets, all right. More's gonna be even, he's gonna be even more painted on look. So I don't think there's any reason to that, but I do like doing it. Next day, I'm gonna come back and start chipping away at the decals with a knife and I'm, they're gonna start flaking off a little bit. Um, you can wet them with the microsol I find to help them chip a bit nicer. Um, but you could always do this with a sponge. I just, I suppose, like the shapes that's made chipping these decals with a knife just that little bit more, which is why I do it in that way. If you want, you can then apply microsol again and get it to bend around the door to be really fixed on. I do that here just because I was making a video, but realistically, I'm just gonna weather that in a further stage and not worry about it too much. It's at that point as well that I start clearing out any hatches or doors where the decal has overlapped between the two pieces. I find it easier than cutting the decal to the right shape before applying it to the model. I just scratch off the decal after it's applied so that it's got the nice separation in between the doors. Normally you would then seal in the decals with a gloss varnish or something like that, but with it being my Iron Warriors tank, I'm actually going to start painting on the hazard stripes because I want to actually seal them in in this with more Wonder Wash. So I'm gonna paint all the yellows and then all of the yellows having Wonder Wash over the top will give it a nice extra depth of color as we move further into the stages of the paint. So I apply Avalon Sunset to all of the areas in a nice thick coat. I think it takes two or three coats of, say a nice thick coat, two or three thin coats to get a nice base color across all of the areas where I want hazard stripes. I then tape off bits of the yellow and alternate using small bits of tape to give me the correct distances for the offsets of each hazard stripe so they all match. That allows me to go round the, not cyclone launcher, what's it called? The launcher, the Havoc launcher that's on top of all of my tanks now. Um, so yeah, is I'm gonna paint all of the hatches, things like that that I want to be yellow to then make them into hazard stripes. I then paint the bits of the the tape with black. I do this by brush, just because I don't want to start taping off excessively anymore. Um, and it's just quicker to do it with black. black. Black over a yellow is a nice forgiving color to just do this by brush. And when I peel off the masking tape, I don't really care if it's overspilled any, because that's just going to be the bits of chipping that's on that hazard stripe onto the color beneath. So it actually helps me out in a way if I get any bleed from having used a brush. At this time in the name of speed, I also block out any locations that I want to be black on the model. So that's the exhaust covers. Um, and then with that, I'll get into the shading of the hazard stripes. So for that, with it being a yellow, I want to pick do you know what? I'm not going to use the technical terms here because I don't know them. <laughs> a, a purple goes really nicely with yellow to shade it. It gives it this nice deep brown burnt shade. So taking the opposite side from where we highlighted as our brightest edges on the tank, I'm going to go to the opposite side of that and shade those edges of the hazard stripes with my purple on top of the yellow. You can do this with a brush like you can see me doing in the mid in the video, or you can do this with an airbrush. It just very it was very quick to just tape around those four sides and shade that with Drutchy Violet through the airbrush. Didn't thin that down, just whacked it through, just as the easiest way of doing it. And it's just the right tool for the right job, really. 
So here's a mistake. I got a bit of overspray on those pieces of tape. So I just go back in, don't really worry about it, touch it up with some, in this case, oh, it's not bolt gun metal anymore, it's lead belcher, uh, because it's an Iron Warrior, right? And we'll never know the difference after all the weathering. Lead belcher is quite a good thing to touch up with no matter what the Legion is, especially around these points where colours meet, because they're usually on hard edges where bullet traps might be, so there might be a lot more damage to those areas. I'm going to next go in with the sponge and just basically start weathering it more. You could seal it in before this step because we've not yet sealed in the transfers, but that needs to be done. But I was just in the swing of it, so started weathering and chipping with silver on top of the hazard stripes and transfers. So I just get that done, I take some silver and apply it using a sponge all over all of the bits of the model that aren't silver currently. If you were doing this to a tank which isn't an Iron Warriors tank, I'd recommend going more heavily around the corners and like the sharp edges of the tank over places where transfers meet just because I think it looks quite well, the edges of transfers rather than in the center of them. Um, and just go to town on it, really. You can, if you've sealed before this point, it does allow you to use a bit of water and use a cotton bud to wipe off any mistakes that you might have made while chipping. That's specifically with a gloss varnish. So you might have wanted to have done that first, but I was just in the swing of it, so carried on with this chipping we bought before having sealed through from the last stage. So I got this a little bit out of order in my haste to get this model done. It was actually being painted for Rakilian Wars event in January and it was being painted like a day before. So I went back and painted the fuel can with a nice camo green colour which I believe was... Oh, which one's this one here? No, not that one. It was Castellan Green. So I painted the Castellan Green on it might look a bit different to yours in this highlighting, <laughs> but yeah, I painted that green, went back to chipping, and now we start on with the brush chipping. This one I actually do, like in the video you might have noticed that I didn't turn the tank when sponge chipping the first time, but I start doing more sponge chipping and turning the tank and doing brush chipping. Now, brush chipping as a thing rather than sponge chipping just allows you that bit more control. You can do bigger chips, more dramatically shaped chips because you've got control directly over how they look. And I do think it's a nice step to add to a model. Now I'm gonna do this all over the tank and I actually tend myself to go a bit overboard with this because I love weathered models. But who cares, they're Iron Warriors, they're meant to be on the front line all the time. Um, and yeah, I start affixing then any additional items that I've not wanted to put on the tank in the first place. So I now attach an AK Interactive camo net. Now, the benefit of this is that you can spray and use oils and enamels on top of that camo net and it just takes them quite nicely. You don't need to be um, undercoated and painted beforehand. So it's just nice and easy to attach to your tank as a little bit extra. So what I do is I get my drill and I just turn a piece of actually barbed wire, I believe it was in this video, because it's what came to hand first, but just to wrap in a solid position around a roll of this camo netting. And then I use a spike off the edge to pin it into place onto the vehicle. The next step in painting the tank, and pretty much any model that I go through, is the non-chippable surfaces. So now we've smashed on all of the chipping, so that's not going to spread over onto things like cloths, or say I don't want to chip brass in the same way, or weather brass in the same way as I want to weather an iron. I'm gonna put all those things on now, and that is after having attached any additions to the model like the camo nets. Now the reason I've done that is so that if there's any frosting from a super glue, I'm still got, I'm going to 
I've got another step to paint over and I don't need to go back to painting after I've already finished it. So in this step, I'm gonna do all the brasses that you can see around the model. So that's gonna be the viewports, things like that. And then I'm finally, finally going to fix all of the transfers into place with a couple more shades of Wonder Wash. So yeah, it's been quite a while since I've sealed this. Now, I, as I said before, I would recommend sealing it right after transfers, unless you want to do something like this where I'm using that sealing in to tint the yellow colour on the hazard stripes and all the colours in general that are now on the tank, I suppose, like the brasses. I think Iron Warriors specifically lend themselves well to this late wonder wash in the process. But just have a think about it yourself as you're going through, off the top of my head, sort of Blood Angels might benefit from this to give a bit more depth to the colour, a bit more richness. Um, so it's worth experimenting with. I then, after having sealed it, go and do a pin wash into any recesses. So in this, I'm getting, giving a bit of depth to that sort of low, the low poly 3D print vent on the top of my tank, just to disguise it that bit more by giving that bit more sort of fake detail. And we will get into the point in the video that you will know well by now, and that is the enamel stage. So in the enamel stage, I'm going to apply the enamel engine grime by AK to all surfaces of the model. Now I do this a bit lighter than I do to most infantry because I don't want there to be so much engine grime on there that it's impossible to get off when it starts streaking. So I give it sort of a mid dusting across the entire model and then I get my trusty or Q-tip in America I suppose but I get my trusty cotton bud as well as some artist's white spirit so that it's less odour. Um, though white spirit will work. And I start streaking with the streaking grime in downwards motions. And I'm going to try and leave sort of, well, streaks, I suppose, in the streaking grime with the cotton bud. I do this in the directions that rain would run down the tank like in real life, because you don't want a horizontal streak. It would, it just looks a bit weird, whereas a, a vertical streak will look like there's been actual water running down the tank, disrupting any mud that's gone up there. Mud splashes are obviously up and down, maybe slightly horizontal, but we'll get onto mud splashes in that way later. So yeah, we're gonna do the, en basically the enamel that we do in all of these painting videos and apply it across the tank. If you want to remove more enamel than you basically would, as you see me doing, try using a brush. I've noticed when I use a brush rather than a, a cotton bud to remove enamels, much more comes off and it gives less of a stain to the undersurface. I think just because the bristles much more easily get into like the, the minute ridges that we can't actually see with our eyes on the model so it cleans them out much better. So the next obvious step that we do in all of these videos is to use the dust spray. And that's a 50-50 mix of Tamiya Flat Flesh and Tamiya Flat Earth. And I just spray that round all elements of the model that's low to the ground, as well as places that would have a very dried mud to pro start providing this base color to the mud effects. So that's where the tracks go up into the hull, I'm going to do that where on the door steps, I'm going to do that on the, <laughs> the door feet, as we established they were called at the back of the model. Um, and yeah, that's going to provide a nice base colour and lighter tone of which we can then apply mud over the top of in a later step. And the next one we'll do is oils for the rust. When that's dried, we get into using oils for the first time. And it's going to be very similar to the enamels. The enamels will dry that slight bit faster, but I start doing the rusts with my oils. Now, I take a 
take a burnt sienna oil and I thin it down and I'm going to use a paintbrush and do a mixture basically of painting on with the paintbrush in specific places with a thick oil paint as well as using a very thin down oil paint that I'm going to use my airbrush to flick the paint off the brush so that it splatters over the tank. When I've done both of those, I use my brush to streak downwards, specifically with the thick rust pieces. And then that will give a nice running effect to the rust where it gets, where it's basically a stronger color at the top and a thinner color at the bottom. And I'm just gonna use a, down, a downward stroking motion to use my white spirit to pull the oil paint in a downwards motion from the rust deposits that I've set up before with my oil paints. Now this can also be done with an enamel paint. I sort of flip flop in between which I like using. In this video, which as I said is eight months ago, we painted this tank, I was using an enamel. The process is exactly the same, but I currently prefer using an oil. If you're really out there, you could mix the two, but like it's just exactly the same process. It's just the enamel dries faster. The oil will go into, like will streak better. So it's just whichever one for the job you think is like going to serve you best. Like in this case, it was like speeds and elements because I was painting it in a couple of days for an event. I was trying to film it at the same time. So it's just literally just whichever one is best for the job for you at the time. There's gonna be no real difference to outcome. I wouldn't say just with a bit of practice. As you can see in this bit, I wasn't happy with the initial effect. So I just carried on adding until I was in fact happy with that. And that's one of the best things about oils or enamels, both of them. You can go back, reactivate them, change them with your uh, white spirit or you can just add more so long as you've sealed before your enamel and oil steps you can just entirely take it back to that gloss varnish stage and just wipe everything out it's really forgiving i'd actually say with like it seems quite overfacing, but oils i would say the the most beginner friendly paint so long as you know not to put them in your mouth like it's, it's just so good, it's so forgiving, gives such a good effect and I would 100% recommend it to everyone that is into painting in any sort of way. So the next and potentially most fun step is the spraying of mud at your models. So here I get a fully loaded paintbrush of the MIG mud splashes effect. So I'm going to start with the lightest colour. And that's because the lightest colour will be the one that's most dried on to the tank. And I actually got this from reading Mig's Mud, Mud magazine uh, back at like a few years ago. So I just fully load the brush with a, a very slightly thinned down mud paint. You'll, you'll quickly learn what is the right consistency for this. If you want to practice, do on the bottom of your tank. But really, you can use spirits with this again to wipe it off as spirits is the thinner for this. So it's like the oil paint in just how forgiving it is and quite an enjoyable process to just spray it all over your tank. So I go around the tank, just building up layers of this, as I said, with the lighter color first and then moving on to the darker colors, which will be the heavier, thicker, fresher muds. So as we work through from the lightest to the darkest color, the lightest colour is going to go the furthest up the tank and the darkest colour will be kept towards the bottom of the tank. And the reason for this is the higher up the tank that the mud has gone, the, l the less times the mud will have reached that level is just the thought process. And therefore the lower down the tank is the most frequently splashed area. So it's going to be the one that's kept the wettest mud there and also the greatest density of mud splashes so by the time you get down to the bottom of the tank like spraying the the two-thirds of the tank with the dry earth then the loose ground sprays like half of it or a third of it 
and then the wet mud sprays a sixth of the tank, you get this nice build up and gradients of levels as you move through the tank. During this step, you can go back and start streaking the mud. So I'm gonna do that in between spraying the dry earth and loose ground, which is I do three steps of this mud. And I just think it gives a nice runny feeling to the tank. Now, if you were doing a desert environment, like Talan, say, or any of the environments that are deserts in the Heresy, right? Or and like maybe you're doing a World War II tank in the desert. Now, you could do this, it gives a nice dusty look, and then just stop here for your tank with the dry earth as the final step. And that's what I meant at the start about just selecting the appropriate technique and steps that you want on your tank and just leaving it there, taking some, adding them to your, your basically your, your book of methods and just discarding the rest. Like even if you just take one thing from this video, add it to your methods, try it out for a bit. I really recommend, especially these. Th these muds are just absolutely fabulous, I find, and just a really fun effect to do. And they add a load to your models as you go on. Like I've used these on capes of my Chaos Lord. I use it on my tanks. I used it on the shields of my Iron Circle. And I just think it gives that real nice effect. Next up comes the loose ground, which is the like sort of the, the mid gray brown color that we're just gonna like splash on up the tank again. I keep this one a bit thicker, but realistically, I'm, I'm trying to do that, but does it matter? I, I'm not sure. Like the main thing is the order in which these goes on to give like a realistic drying process to the mud that the tank's been through. So I go around the entire tank repeating that step and then move on to the final step, which is the wet mud. So that's going to be the thickest and the one that comes most at the bottom of the tank. As you can see, I've been working down the tank as, we mo as we've moved along. And so the, only the very bottoms of the tank, maybe the bottom sixth, will be covered by the wet mud. For the final step, because I'm trying to get it on so thickly onto the model to give that nice dense mud as if it's just driven through a Russian winter, I'm going to apply that with the brush to just be so thick. Now it does take a couple of days then to dry just because of the thickness of the product. But so long as you're not in the rush, I think I might have even done this step after I'd come back from the event because of the time pressure. Applying with the brush to give that thickness, I think adds a nice volumetric measure to your weathering steps rather than everything just being painted on 2D scratches on the model. It gives that bit of 3D texture. So the best way I could think of doing this was actually just to illustrate it in Photoshop. So we've got our lens that we're gonna paint all black. Do, 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 just black it all out. Um, and that's give the darkest color in the shade to the background. Next, I'm gonna pick, I pick, well, I picked green on this Rhino for the lens. So I'm gonna paint in away from the light source. So if the light source is the top left of the model, we're looking at the, we're looking. <laughs> so if we're looking at the front of the model, the light source will be mirrored to over here. The, this will be at the top left from the model's perspective, the top right from like sort of stage right perspective. Stay, no, that's stage left. <laughs> right, so we're going to go to the opposite side of the lens and paint with like a dark green color. Next, we'll select a mid green color and paint this sort of shape. And I'm not too worried, but it's just getting down further and further into the highlights to give a nice color to the lens. We're next going to go a bit further highlight into the corner and just build the lightness into the corner of the lens to give it that reflectiveness. Finally, after say like that's moot, 
moot green would that be? I don't know, just select any greens. It does. <laughs> this step doesn't massively matter what colour you're using because it'll never really be matched. I'm then finally going to put a yellow right into the corner to give it that absolute shine. And then finish with a dot as sun glare in the sunward direction from over the stage left area here. So that is painting lenses and we'll see it on the model. So I did like going back to that Iron Warriors Rhino. I am quite pleased with the result of it. Even just updating my old army with new ideas within there, like the camo netting, more Greek borders to the transfers, additional steps to the weathering that I've practiced on the Solar Auxilia and Valhallans that I've been painting, and just experimenting with new things in old methods. New methods on old things. <laughs> Hopefully you learned something regardless of whether you play Iron Warriors or just use any army that you enjoy the weathering process and the look of weathered models. If you like a single bit of it, take the single bit. If you like all of it, copy my the style <laughs> entirely. But the point of these guides, of all of the insert clickbait videos that I've done, is to just hopefully inspire you to do a little bit more painting and start enjoying the process again and not stress out like I used to and, and still do sometimes over painting because it needs to be perfect. It doesn't and we all need to just remind ourselves that it should be an enjoyable process that we're not too hung up on the minutiae of each individual step being absolutely perfect. So if you like the video don't forget to hit like, comment below and subscribe to the channel. Ring the bell icon for more videos like this and to be notified of new games coming out and guides. And if you really liked it, there is a Patreon link below where you can get ad-free videos, a link to the Discord, a bouncy tray and dice. And I'll catch everyone next time in a bit.